about what you've been doing in Baltimore or what you were involved in with, um, with Johns Hopkins. Uh, Johns Hopkins Medical School formed a, uh, they're in the middle of the neighborhood that was 70% depopulated, 70% vacancy. Literally the show, The Wire, was filmed around that neighborhood. Uh, there were armed guards at the corner of every uh, um, corner around the hospital, and it was a very difficult place. The city, uh, the Anna E. Casey Foundation, uh, Johns Hopkins as a major stakeholder, uh, did a, a um, bought out all the residents, tore down the houses, uh, gave them money, far more than the value of their houses, to move. They had the chance to move back when it was done. And then they did an, an RFP uh, to create a new mixed income, uh, mixed use neighborhood uh, on 50 acres of land around the, the campus. Built a new school, built new retail, uh, lots of local jobs. And so that was something that never could have happened without that public-private partnership and couldn't have happened without all of those players contributing. And even so, the economics didn't work. They put out an RFP in Forest City, uh, was selected to be the developer, and it's going to be a 30-year development. Where would Jane Jacobs have stood on something like that, Peggy? Because it is yeah, big. It's, good, it's big a, in a way. Well, I'm, boy, I'm not sure. In I relation to Little. But, but I, I, I appreciate your... your starting your comments with saying that what Jane Jacobs would have argued for back then is different than what would be argued for now because things are different and she would be arguing for change. But um, my, my reaction to the scenario that you're describing is that in some way the market has picked up the Jane Jacobs um, cry. And, um, and I'm not positive that that's what <laughs> Jane Jacobs would have actually in, intended. You know, in, in some way, um, we could say, and I'm not, I'm not saying that this is totally what you're describing, but the marketing of lifestyle in some way is, is what this has turned into, and I think that she would not be pleased with, 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 that, with that kind of description. Um, and uh, you know, the, the kind of turning over of, of the street as, as festival to, um, to developers who will, who will um, they basically hit a particular market, and I don't think that's the general um, disempowered population, you know, it should be talked about. It also should be talked about that universities are nonprofit organizations, and so when they actually buy properties in cities, they don't actually have to pay taxes. And so it's a very, very difficult proposition when universities expand and, and say that it's in the, in the cause of, of city planning. Um, Andre, coming back to you, you talked about Greenwich Village. I mean, it's hard, not to, it's hard to imagine that Jane Jacobs wouldn't have had a few things to say about NYU right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's safe to assume she would be in the opposing <laughs> camp. Um, I mean, we, I, we haven't been involved in that uh, campus, but um, I think, again, you know, it's very, well, as an architect, it's easy to see both sides because you understand that universities today, especially universities that are landlocked and that don't have that reserve of growth space like Alston and Harvard or uh, Manhattanville uptown, um, where are they going to go but up? And to stay competitive, the universities need you know, bigger floor plates, higher floor to floor heights. Um, they need more amenities to retain their faculty. Um, and so it's a, it is a complex set of issues. How has the changing economy changed some of these equations? You, you talk about that a good amount. That, and, and you do too, Sheila, the need to take on, to grapple with scale at a different level from uh, 40, 40 I, years ago. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, or my perspective, um, Jane Jacobs wasn't against uh, large scale. Uh, she was just against space for the sake of space and not considering what creates life in a community uh, and considering uh, eyes on the street and assimilation of children and so on and so on. But from Big's perspective, we share Mary's optimism. Um, I, I think there are... We continue to improve cities across the world, um, grapple with similar um, issues and problems, gentrification and um, uh, friction between, between groups um, and so on. But I think one of the things that we're very engaged in at BIG currently is injecting deliberate social benefits into infrastructure. For example, someone mentioned the High Line as their uh, favorite place. Um, that's a great example of 
so we had this industrialization uh, period, and a lot of those infrastructural institutions or systems now no longer serve the function that they were created to serve. They've been decommissioned, or they, we just don't need that function anymore. So what we're seeing is around the world, cities are trying to rethink how they can use that existing infrastructure. The High Line is a great example of that. Um, and so we're thinking about how can you not just use decommissioned infrastructure to generate new social benefits, but how can you think that into urban planning from the get-go? Um, so how can you birth infrastructure with benefits to the community? I think that there is a way of uh, considering infrastructure that's about, I think the high line is great, but actually it's a social benefit, but it's very disconnected socially. And I think that considering, um, as we look at, at you know, well, and just, just elaborate what you mean by that, because people are wondering what you mean by um, the people on the high line are not the same people that live in the housing. Well, it's 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 this beautiful jewel-like uh, uh, place with the extra guards and extra money and extra everything. Um, I'd love to see it tied back into the city. Uh, for instance, what if all the roofs along that corridor were watering that uh, corridor and the people saw the runoff water from the High Line and so the people begin to relate to it not just as a beautiful place to look out, but what if they begin to understand uh, where they live and what's happening in the city in a different way through uh, being up there. Mm -hmm.